Hello everyone and welcome back to Mossy Bottom for a very unusual video. In a few short weeks it will be my 42nd birthday and the number 42 has always held a lot of importance to me because thanks to Douglas Adams and the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, 42 will for me and millions of other people forever be associated with the meaning of life. So to celebrate becoming 42 myself, I have decided to revisit my How to Thrive as an Introvert series and share with you 42 statements which I think best define the meaning of my life. I am an introvert, despite the fact that, yes, I can talk into a camera, and almost a decade ago I quit the rat race and a decade of office work with it to pursue my dream of living as self-sufficiently as I could and find a sense of meaning which until that time had been missing from my life. The rest of my story is out there in the dozens of YouTube videos that I've made over the years, and many of these statements you will find in those videos too. This was an exercise in trying to bring them all together in a way to define who 42-year-old me really is. Yes, there are contradictions, especially if you look for them, because life is complicated and full of nuances. I bet there are plenty of contradictions in your life too. Speaking of which, if you want to truly understand who you are as a person, whatever age you might be, then I would recommend having a go at writing the statements which define you. It's been a liberating experience for me, and I feel like I know myself better than I have ever known myself at any stage in my life. So let's start with a biggie. What is the point of life? Well, aside from 42, I believe that life simply is about finding daily contentment in the pursuit of happiness, without, of course, harming others. In my 9 to 5 office job back in my 20s, I had neither of those things, but I've come to realise that they're both equally important. Daily contentment is about waking up and wanting to do the things that you get to do that day. Sure, there'll be a few that you don't, Right now, I spend my days bucking and splitting firewood, restoring windows, building a propagation room, walking my puppy, playing with my daughter, making videos like this, uh, and reading endless books about restoration. Most of that, in fact all of that, I'd rather do than not do. Sure, I have to drive quite a bit too, not so keen on that, and I have to pick up dog poop now and again, definitely not keen on that, and I have to deal with Finnish bureaucracy more than I would like. But most of each day, I get to do the things that I want to do. And that, I've learnt, is what contentment looks like for me. And when you find contentment, you stop being angry at the world. I was pretty angry in my 20s. Happiness is a dream. And we all need to chase our dreams because that's where motivation comes from and ambition and drive. Achieving those dreams is a lot less important, which is why at some point uh, in my 30s, I realised that the pursuit of happiness is about as close to happiness as I was going to get. So don't ever stop chasing. <laughs> Like most people, I didn't really pursue my dream for a long time. I jumped in the sea and swam with the tide like all the other fishes. But one thing I now know is that if you're unhappy, the surest way to stay unhappy is to keep doing what you've always done. Hello there, I'm Rosie. Welcome to this guided walking meditation designed to help you walk off any feeling of panic. There are some days when my seated meditation practice is replaced by walking. The day I had my first panic attack is a day I will always remember vividly. It took me a long time to find the courage to turn around and start swimming in the opposite direction. I finally did that by taking myself out of my comfort zone. I quit my job and I spent a year doing voluntary work overseas which became the catalyst for spending my life savings on Mossy Bottom, my derelict cottage in Ireland. And that experience taught me that comfort zones are comfortable, yes, because routine is easy. But if your days lack contentment and your dreams are unpursued, then a comfort zone is just a trap and one which you need to figure out how to escape from. 
though that is hard. Of course, if when stripped bare you find that what you most want is that which you've given up, then lucky you, you just found purpose again. Regrets? The only ones I have are missed opportunities, not taken ones that went wrong, and I think that's true of most people that I've asked at least. I know this is a cliché, but life is a journey, not a destination. The path is meant to be winding with twists and bumps and sometimes potholes or even sinkholes which we have to scramble out of. If you try and walk in a straight line because 10 or 20 years ago you made a plan, then you'll probably end up crawling through a jungle or worse still, getting stuck in a bog with no way out and we've all been there. A big thank you to Headspace for sponsoring this video. And Headspace, if you haven't heard of it already, is about mental health, something which we're all learning to pay more attention to. As an introvert myself, I overthink everything. I'm a worrier, and I've always envied enormously those lucky people who can just live in the moment, like Moss, my dog, always could. Who can let go of their thoughts and worries and be present even if there are huge things going on in the background of their lives. That doesn't come naturally to me, despite the life I have. When I moved to Ireland, I started walking through my forest every day. The same lap three times, over and over and over again. As I walked, I let all my thoughts pour out. I talked to myself. God knows what Moss thought. But as I did, worries became plans, problems became solutions. My brain felt like it was being defragmented as I walked. Then I'd sit down on my meditation stone. Some of you may remember that stone uh, from my first How to Thrive as an Introvert video. And I'd just listen to the birds. I'd watch the branches, the clouds, leaves and I'd feel the wind, the cold, or the warmth of the stone on a hot sunny day, or moss sat next to me. And the more I did it, the better I got at switching off my thinking brain and turning up my senses. It wasn't about judging or reacting, just observing. I've been doing that ever since, for seven or eight years now, and it's honestly hard to put into words quite how much it has helped me. Some people may think my life is stress-free because I live closer to nature, but that's not what quitting the rat race is about. I came here, as I did in Ireland, to invest in my life, not escape from it. To make it richer. And that means adding things that really matter to me. I have a partner, a daughter. I live in a new country with a different language in a new old house that needs caring for, on a piece of the earth which demands a lot of my time. And I love all of those things, as well as making these videos which I hope inspire others. But none of that stuff comes without stress. Headspace is like a gym membership for your brain, except it's not hard work. Whether it's managing daily stress, or getting better sleep, or even using exercise to promote a healthier mind. It's all there in one app where you can pick and choose what you want to absorb or just let go of the reins and be guided. And that, I think, is its greatest strength because the hardest thing about meditation, mindfulness, looking after your brain, whatever you want to call it, is having to think about it when you're so overwhelmed trying to think about everything else in your life. Where do you start? What do you do? How do you make it fit into your day? With Headspace, you don't need to figure any of that out. You just start listening. There's so much there, like sleep casts, which Angela and I absolutely love, in which you're immersed in this moment in nature, from a desert campfire to a Himalayan mountaintop, 
and all you have to do is observe, just as I do sat on my stone. And for those who want to understand mental health challenges more deeply, there's so much knowledge there too, like their many podcast series. So if you are curious about ways to improve your own mental health or just want to learn a bit more about it, then give Headspace a try. I cannot recommend it enough. And you'll find a link to a free 60-day trial down in the description of this video. By the way, in case you've been wondering, this is my new meditation stone here in Finland. Now I just need to persuade Tup to come up here. It is quite high, much higher than my one in Ireland, uh, to keep me warm because it's very chilly. <laughs> Amazing spot though. It's magic hour here in the Black Forest. Introversion is something to embrace, not overcome. It took me a long time to figure that out, and the embracing it part really took every ounce of courage that I had, especially in a world that associates extroversion with success, which, like so many other introverts, I've learned to fake over the years, at great cost to my own mental health. But embracing being an introvert is the single biggest positive change that I've made in my life. And it comes down to accepting who you are, rather than trying to be something that you're not. Personally, I don't want to come out of my shell. I used to, because everyone that I trusted, my friends and family, told me to. Until I realised that I was born with that shell, and I'm a heck of a lot happier living inside it. And that isn't sad or pitiable, it's something to celebrate. These days, if I'm afraid of something and I don't want to do it, then I just don't, guilt-free. But conversely, if I'm afraid of something and I do want to do it, and I always know, then I make damn sure that I find the courage to do that thing. As we all know, it gets easier to be you as you get older. And sometimes you fail. I failed in career choices and academic pursuits. I failed in relationships, who hasn't? I failed uh, because I've made bad, uneducated decisions. I failed because I've overthought something and been too slow to act or too afraid of it going wrong. I failed because I've just got unlucky. But I earnestly believe that a failure is an opportunity to succeed in the future. Not just to succeed, but to overcome. And what could be more satisfying than overcoming personal failure? That's the stuff of Hollywood movies. Even though, like most people, I still get frustrated when things don't work out as I expected them, uh, I find that frustration is short-lived and very quickly replaced with determination. That's a learnt behaviour. Accepting failure as a fundamental part of life makes you a lot less afraid, and it makes me sad that fear of failing is why so many people don't do the things they truly want to do. And most people know, I think, what it is they truly want to do with their lives. It's also sad that social media bombards us with extremes of beauty, of skill, of luck, and of stuff going horribly wrong. The positive extremes just make us feel inadequate by comparison, and the negative extremes scare us so much that we're terrified of trying anything new, even though the odds of disaster are pretty darn low. Risk is part of human evolution. If my life is over-sanitised, and it has been at times, then it's not as exciting. I know that from experience. Now that's not to say that I have a desire to go base jumping or free soloing, I don't, but managed risk, like for me and my family moving here to Finland. Trusting in yourself to solve problems as they arise, rather than mindlessly adhering to a system that protects you, is actually very, very liberating. On the subject of problems and obstacles, every path I've taken in life has been full of them, even knowing it was the right path for me. And there are many things I don't talk about on this channel because, well, I value some degree of privacy and I think I have the right to choose what I share and don't share with the world. But I am at heart, often to the supreme irritation of Angela, my partner, an eternal optimist. The glass is always half full. I do not let problems and obstacles hold me back. I focus on finding solutions and on the good things. Sometimes people 
just like to have a good moan. Heck, I'm British, I get that, and I do too. But for me, a problem is just a solution waiting to be found. And having that mindset stops you being held back by things. A woodpecker has joined me. Now that wouldn't have happened in Ireland. <laughs> Another word for problems and obstacles is compromise. And compromise used to be hard for me. I am a perfectionist. It's why my YouTube videos don't really look like most people's YouTube videos. I can't just pick up a camera and start talking. Well, I suppose I can, but I don't then like the end result. I'm someone who has to plan, make notes, bullet points, rehearse sometimes and re-record if I mess it up. It used to be that if something wasn't quite right, uh, I'd have an urge to walk away entirely. But with contentment, as I found in recent years, has come the realization that you can't choose not to compromise because inaction or walking away is in itself a compromise. If you do that, you're compromising on the thing you set out to achieve. These days, I don't waste my life waiting for perfect. My father sadly died at 51, as I've talked about in several videos. Life can be unpredictably short. The best things I've given, be it to an individual or to the world at large, I've either written, grown or made. Let's talk a bit about control because that, I think, is at the heart of self-sufficiency as a lifestyle. Taking control of the fundamental processes of life, food, water, shelter, warmth, is more fulfilling than earning money and paying into a system that takes control of those processes away from me. And yes, I'm fully accepting of the fact that not everyone feels that way. Most people probably don't. But I think those who value that control, like me, are a growing minority. You only have to look at the popularity of survival and self-sufficiency on YouTube, TV and other platforms to realize that. If you are on the fence, then try growing some potatoes. If, not if you're literally on the fence. I mean, if you're unsure, <laughs> then try growing some potatoes in your garden or in a planter on your balcony and see how it makes you feel. You might be surprised. And to those who know that this lifestyle or something similar is right for them, but haven't quite found a way of making it happen yet, don't despair because there are ways out. You just have to search for them, compromises and all. And to those who have already lived this lifestyle, but have reached a stage in their lives where it's no longer possible, and so enjoy living vicariously through those that still try to, like me, please keep reminding the world what joy you found in providing for yourself, because it's inspirational. People occasionally wonder why I don't ride around on a horse and cart and knit my own sweaters from my own sheep's wool. Well, I don't have any sheep, that's one reason. The truth is, I am fascinated with those processes and others like it. Possibly my favourite ever factual TV show is called Victorian Farm, in which archaeologists and historians live on a functioning farm exactly as it would have been in the Victorian era. Edwardian Farm was the sequel and even more compelling to watch. But I think self-sufficiency in the 21st century is about embracing the technology that makes that lifestyle not just easier, but richer, not going back in time. There's a new Walden out there, folks, and it comes with solar panels and an internet connection. I'm fascinated by the past, but I don't want to live in it. Of course, to have solar panels and an internet connection, you need money. Living without any money is impossible. And those people that claim to, well, dig a bit deeper and you might find they're living off book royalties or something similar. I've never pretended to not need money when pursuing a self-sufficient life. But, and this is a really big but, living with a lot less money is a lot more possible than most people realize. And having less money makes you value all the things that money can't buy, like time with your family, that much more. Money, after all, is a tool, time is a gift, and one that you can never earn more of or get back when it's gone. And I think everyone knows that. It's one of those truisms that we all just ignore. Why? Well, because making money is an addiction, and stopping when you have enough is really, really hard. 
It's like asking a gambler to stop placing bets when he or she is winning. But of course, like any other addiction, making money comes at a cost, and that cost is time. Time building relationships, playing with your kids, or even having kids, pursuing your dreams, doing all the little things that make you that bit more contented every day. Most people sacrifice all that for a bit more in the bank. Or more likely, that next thing they've been tricked into buying so they need a bit more in the bank. It's interesting that most of these philosophies and ideas are a product of my 30s and now the beginning of my 40s. But there's one or two which I've believed for a very long time. And this is one. Most things in this world are complicated and having black and white absolute views that don't examine all those blurry nuances is not very useful. A good example is eating animal products, which I made a whole video on a few years ago. I can't really put myself in any category there because, well, it's complicated. And sometimes being able to say it's complicated rather than taking a side is really important. Another is that humans are part of nature and should not be forced to exist apart from it. I think the mass migration of people from living in the countryside to living in cities over the last 50 years or so, globally, has had a terrible impact on mental health. And turning nature into something untouchable that we're permitted to walk through on a designated footpath but not interact with or sleep in or forage food in or feel like we're part of in the way that thousands of our direct ancestors were is not that different to putting a polar bear in a concrete cell in the zoo and then wondering why it paces back and forth all day. Of course, the flip side is that nature should not be exploited as a dollar sign. Neither of those two philosophies is healthy, and one, I suspect, fuels the other. Because if humans exist apart from nature, then what is nature if not something to use? You wouldn't tell a fox not to catch and eat a rabbit, or a beaver not to fell enough trees to make a dam. But if you woke up one day and every rabbit had been killed by foxes and every tree felled by beavers, then you'd probably think something was out of whack. And yet when it's people doing it, and they do every day, most of us don't bat an eyelid. Why? Well, because living in our concrete cells, we've forgotten that it's our own home that we're exploiting. Here's something I've realised here in Finland. Conformity is useful, curiosity is joyful. And something I've known for a long time, but being a YouTuber, I've really had to remind myself of. Being nice is a sure way to win any argument. Being right, but not nice, is a sure way to lose it. Okay, we're reaching the end, folks. Time to talk about something which I have never discussed on this channel, believe it or not. And that is not my ceiling or roof, <laughs> the big guy. My 42 years of life have taught me that if there is a God, then he, she, it, they, whatever, exist in everything around me, in the beauty of the world and the universe, and the miraculous things which I see in it. And that is enough for me. Death, I believe, is an end point, which is why life is so precious. A few years ago, I lost a cousin to suicide. He was the same age that I am now. And I made a video about it because it seemed like the only thing I could do that had any meaning. I said that life is like a train with people constantly jumping on and off. A few people on the train might notice when you're gone, but the train doesn't care. It just keeps chugging away to that next horizon endlessly. To me, that is liberating because it makes me feel blissfully insignificant. And I like that feeling. I don't want the spotlight on me. That's too much pressure. I just want to be another passenger chasing my own destination. It also makes me feel incredibly grateful because in the four billion years that that train has been chugging away, picking up and dropping off passengers on planet Earth, what are the chances that I'm sat on it right now? Almost zero. And yet here I am. We've all won the lottery just to be conscious in this moment. Of course, we're not aware of the immense span of time that we're not conscious, so it's hard to appreciate because 
consciousness is all we've ever known. But if you take a step back, and it's hard to do, I admit, and think about the history of humanity, the history of life and the universe, all of which you've missed, just as I have, it makes one realize just how precious this moment really is. One thing's for sure, for as long as I can hang on to my seat on that train, I'm gonna do everything I can to enjoy the ride. Hi, welcome to Headspace. In this session, we focus on the nature of change and the interconnection we have to this regenerating nature of life. Okay, we finally arrived at statement 42, and I should point out that everything you've heard has been my own thoughts put into words as best I can. Of course, there are plenty of truisms and cliches because that's what meaningful things often become. But 42 is gonna be a quote, the only quote in this video but one I've loved since hearing as a 17 year old in a song, believe it or not, called Everyone's Free to Wear Sunscreen. <laughs> Taken from an article, I think, written by an American journalist. And here it is. Advice is a form of nostalgia. Dispensing it is a way of fishing the past out from the disposal, wiping it off, painting over the ugly parts and recycling it for more than it's worth. It's so true that, isn't it? Which means you should probably take everything in this video with a rather large pinch of salt because it's all just one person's perspective, as is every piece of advice you ever hear. Ultimately, the only advice that's probably worth listening to is trust yourself. People don't do enough of that. That is just about it for this video, folks. Thank you for watching, for subscribing, and continuing to support my channel in the many ways that you do. It's now mid-March, believe it or not, but we've just had another 20 centimeters of snowfall here in Finland. Winter is clinging on with its icy tendrils. But I'm gonna make a prediction. By the time you see me next, not only will I be aged 42, but the snow will have melted and new life will be growing here on my small holding. I do love the snow, but I don't think I've ever been so excited to welcome the spring as I am now. There's just so much to do and I can't wait to get started. For now though, from me and my family, take care of yourselves, keep riding that train, and I'll see you again very soon. Bye bye. Oh 